The Earth Tree is seen as the nexus for the vast majority of life in the lands between, the focal point through which we can observe the cycle of natural life. There are, however, some exceptions, outcasts to the current order. There are those who live in death, those touched by the crucible, and then there are those beings made by the hand of humankind. In the depths of the Eternal Cities, we find the pitiable abominations known as the Dragonkin Soldiers, an unnatural attempt by the Nox to recreate the power of the dragons. There are the Silver Tear Mimics, a result of Nox alchemy that exists to mimic natural life. But of course, the most iconic example of artificial life in the Lands Between is the Albanorix, a people of two different generations found all throughout the Lands Between. The Albanorix are a fascinating case in the lore, not only because of their artificial nature, but because of the widespread persecution that they face from a myriad of different factions. And aside from these story beats, the Albanorix are a case study in the themes of alchemy, life, and destiny all in one. At their core, the Albanorix are an alchemical trope, an attempt to create the perfect form of life and yet in so doing, a new, flawed race has been born. A race full of hopes and desires, yet are mercilessly persecuted for their disconnect from the Erd Tree and its cycle of life. By studying these fascinating people, we can not only learn more about the nature of life within the lands between, but also about the beliefs and prejudices of those found within it. It is one of the greatest stories told in Elden Ring, anchored by the game's greatest lore item, that not only enriches our understanding of life within this world, but simultaneously manages to be a genuinely emotional story of a people who deserve so much more. So join me this week as we explore the plight of the Albanorix. And remember guys, if you like Elden Ring lore, then consider subscribing to the channel, as I have hours of lore content for you to enjoy. I think it is fitting that we start this discussion with the greatest lore item in the game, an item that holds a special place in this channel if you are new to the channel, the Albanoric Blood Clot, which reads as follows. The thick, coagulated blood of the Albanoric, material used for crafting items. Albanoric are life forms made by human hands, thus many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Erd Tree's grace. So the core of the identity of the Albanorix is defined by two key components. One, they are artificial, and two, they are not connected to the world or cycle of the Erd Tree. The latter is something we will look at later in the video, but it is the former, their artificial nature, that is tied to their origins, and is thus what we will begin with. Besides being artificially created, the Albanorix may initially appear like a mystery in terms of where they actually come from, but we can start to understand when we unpack the related lore items. A good example of where to start is of course the Ripple Blade, a weapon wielded by the Albanorix themselves, which reads the following. Unique weapon wielded by young Albanorix. This sword is modelled after the ripples that are thought to be the origin of their species. Some may see this as a somewhat abstract description of their origin story, but the idea of ripples is of course to make us think of a liquid origin. Indeed, we may get further evidence of said liquid via the blue silver armour. This is the armour set worn by the Albanoric wolf archers. This set reads as follows. Chainmail hood, crafted with blue silver, worn by the wolf riding Albanoric archers. Blue silver is a metal born from the same mother as the archers themselves and provides protection from magic and frost. So according to this piece of lore, the Albanorix are born from the same source of metallurgy as the blue silver armour, and with that ripple description in hand, we can conclude that they are born from some kind of liquid silver. This also seems to match up with the actual look of the Albanoric blood clot and the silver liquid that they bleed when you hit them. And it can lead us to a fairly surface level conclusion already at this stage. They are man-made and they are born of a liquid silver, thus they are a human-made experiment born 
of some kind of alchemy. However, we can dig a little deeper and find the origins of this alchemy if we dare look at some cut content and related life forms. With that said, let us start with the cut content I'm referring to. As I always say when we look at cut content, it is a double-edged sword. In some cases, it can be used to look at the intention behind some lore. In other areas, it was obviously completely scrapped and no longer has any bearing. So take it with a pinch of salt. But what I'm bringing your attention to is a cut dialogue from Tops, who at one stage would have said the following additional line after telling us about the Glintstone Key before we entered Laernia proper. He said, Oh, one more thing. Beware the Albanorix, accursed souls born of a forbidden rite of the Eternal City. The curse withered the legs of the old and silenced the tongues of the frogs and now they hold deep grudges for anyone left untouched. So it appears it would have been made extremely clear as to where the Albanorix originated from at one point, the Eternal Cities. Now this does make a lot of sense given what we know of the Eternal Cities and the Nox and their experimentation, and so it is to the Nox that we turn to next. Even before we find this cut dialogue, the Nox have always been a really solid fit for the creators of the Alban Oryx, given the Nox's proven aptitude for experimentation, alchemy, and life manipulation. So let's go over the Nox and their history briefly. But if you want a more intense take on the Nox, I have done an Eternal Cities lore video, which I will link below. We know from the Nox armor sets that they were banished underground for conspiring against the Greater Will and now they are in internal anticipation of their liege, of the coming of the Age of Stars, and a Lord of Night. And therefore, it is logical to conclude that most of the Nox efforts and experimentations are part of their effort to overthrow the Greater Will and bring up a Lord of Night. The first example of this is the object that I assume led to their banishment in the first place, the Finger Slayer Blade. This blade is a bizarre product but it is evidently needed to kill a two fingers, as Rani seems unable to do it without this tool, suggesting its form and origins are special and necessary. Indeed, it is a blade that is formed from a corpse, something that should immediately make the player think of the sacred relic blade, the blade wielded by the Elden Beast at the end of the game. The sacred relic blade seems to be a more refined and divine process, done almost instantaneously, by the Elden Beast to create a well-formed and sophisticated weapon. This is of course in stark contrast to the appearance of the gross and malformed Finger Slayer Blade, which leads me to conclude that this is a perversion of the same process utilised by the Elden Beast. The Noxian penchant for experimentation, science and alchemy is further expressed through the Dragon Kin soldiers. An attempt to manufacture and hybridise the power of the dragons that has ultimately led to a pitiful failure. So it is clear that the Nox are no strangers to life manipulation via science, and this can be further explored via their work on puppetry that introduces us to their alchemical work. We learn that puppetry can be traced back to the Nox via the Night Maiden and Sorceress puppet description, which reads, An old puppet crafted in the Eternal City. These sisters, members of a cold-blooded race, who wielded flowing weapons, became puppets of their own volition. Preceptor Selvis will of course continue the work of the Eternal Cities in this regard, and it is by working with Selvis that we learn that puppetry is essentially a process of alchemy, as Selvis distills new puppet potions for us when we bring him Starlight Shards, even attempting to bind a demigod like Rani via Amber Stars and the description of Amber Starlight Shards makes it clear that puppetry must be linked to fate manipulation, the distillation of fate latent within the stars to control or puppet someone else's destiny. The fact that the Nox developed a process to distill the fate latent within the stars to bind people really is an indicator of their alchemical brilliance. This brilliance is also reflected in a similar work, The Celestial Dew, the description of which reads as follows. A hidden tear found in the Eternal City, also known as a night tear, 
allows one to carry out an absolution at the Church of Vows, reversing all antagonizations. Once upon a time, the stars of the night sky guided fate, and this is a recollection of those times. Again, this is an incredible product. Again, somehow distilling the fate latent within the stars, manipulating it, and allowing one to reverse the actions that they have taken, all through a potion. The point of going over these facts so carefully is because it gives a really great idea that these people are capable alchemists, and thus the perfect candidates for the creation of the Albanorix, who, as we have already discussed, are seemingly born from a liquid silver, a alchemical formula. To further reinforce the connections to the Nox, there is another potential form of artificial life which we must consider, the Silver Tears. The Silver Tears are a fairly mysterious life form, but ones that also appear to be both a substance and a living creature, a substance that is remarkably similar to the blood of the Albanorix. So in this next chapter, we'll examine the potential motive behind the creation of these Silver Tears, and what it can potentially tell us about the origin of the Albanorix by reverse engineering the details of the Silver Tears creation. When it comes to consider the nature of these creatures, the Silver Tears, there is nothing in-game that explicitly mentions they are artificial lives. However, as we will look at in a moment, there is extensive cut content regarding a Silver Tear that makes it pretty clear that this is the intention. However, their alchemical substance form, their presence within the Eternal Cities, should be enough for us to consider that possibility. After all, as we have already examined, the Nox are master experimenters, and masters at manipulating life and fate. Aside from that, the Silver Tear Husk, an item related to the Silver Tears, gives us a lot of insight into the potential purpose of these beings and their relation to life. The item reads as follows. A hardened husk shed by a formless life form known as the Silver Tear, found in and around the Eternal City. The Silver Tear makes a mockery of life, reborn again and again into imitation. Perhaps one day, it will be reborn a lord. The end of this statement is a very pointed statement, as it refers to the mimicry ability of the Silver Tears, as we witness in our fight with the Mimic Tear, in the hope that it will one day take the form of a lord. Again, this harkens back to the overarching goals of the Nox, to remind you, the Monk Armour set states, Now they live under a false sky, in eternal anticipation of their liege, of the coming age of stars, and their lord of night. This to me marries up well with the Silver Tear Husk, which talks about Mimic Tears being reborn a lord, and again is one of the connections in the in-game lore that makes us think that the Silver Tears are man-made by the Nox. They are an alchemical attempt to create a life form that will one day mimic the form of a lord, their lord of night. However, if these implications were not enough for you, and you wanted a more explicit reasoning as to how the Silver Tears are man-made by the Nox to achieve this aim, there was a cut content quest that went over this entire subject far more explicitly and I am referring to the cut quest of Isimi, the mimic who would be Lord. There is a great reimagining of this quest that has been done by Nulrin, and I will link that video below as it even includes these lost dialogues. In short, you would meet a sentient mimic called Isimi, who would latch onto you in a sort of symbiotic relationship. She would provide you power, while she would slowly copy your form. The finale of the quest would see Asimi leaving you after fully mimicking your form, with the intention of her being that you would become Elden Lore and you would allow her to become the Sovereign Eternal, but instead you seek them out and defeat them. This again lines up with what we already know of the Silver Tears from the Silver Husk description, that the ultimate aim of these experiments, of these tears, were to mimic the form of a Lord, their Sovereign Eternal, their Lord of Night. And because it lines up with the existing lore and doesn't seem to contradict it, I have no reason to doubt the lore found in this quest, and if I was to guess why it was cut, I would say it's because it actually provides just too much of a lore dump, 
and possibly provided an alternative ending that they just didn't have time to implement properly. In part of this quest, Asimi would ask the player to visit the Eternal Cities to find the source of her people. The dialogue would go as follows. My Lord Host, Great Host, may I ask something of you? A chalice is close by, the cradle of my kind. Would you mind finding it for me? The chalice will quench my thirst, rejuvenate my flesh, and allow me to grant you further strength. My Lord Host, Great Lord Host, a tear chalice lies in these lands too. Our mother chalice, please search out this most sacred chalice. It is suffused with the blessed wonders of the stars. It will allow us to become a perfect whole. So obviously this dialogue is really revealing. And it talks about a mother chalice, the source of silver tears. And this really sums up what I've been implying. That the silver tears were an alchemical creation of the Nox an attempt to mimic and artificially create their Lord of Night, a Sovereign Eternal. The talk of a mother chalice suffused with the stars obviously makes us think of a liquid, a formula. We have already seen how the Nox can manipulate and distill the fate latent within the stars, and why not use this to create a new life form? With this understanding, we can now turn our attention back to the subjects of this video, the Albanorics themselves, who are an artificial being that bleed a silver formula. The aim of the Nox is to bring about an Age of Stars and a Lord of Night, and to me, this is the driving force behind all of their creation, one way or another. The Dragonkin soldiers and the puppets give them new weapons to wield against the Greater Will and their enemies, and the manipulation of fate gives them an edge and of course a new life form in the hope of artificially creating a Lord of Night is an attempt to bring their ultimate goal into fruition via their own hands and knowledge. It is clear that the Albanorix are beings of magical origin, meaning that the arcane was used to create them. We learn of this innate arcaneness via the Albanorix staff, which reads as follows. The Albanorix harbour a secret. They cast sorcery using their innate arcaneness. To me, their innate arcaneness is no doubt linked to the alchemical, magical, and fate manipulation techniques we've already seen the Nox employ to create artificial life and manipulate life. In essence, it is not hard to see that the Albanorx may be a connected line of work that resulted in the Silver Tears and the Albanorx, especially given their silver blood and artificial nature. Indeed, even item placement may suggest a kinship between the two beings, as we can find the larval core of a silver tear in amongst some corpses at the Albanoric village. <laughs> Zuli also makes this connection as well between the silver tears and the Albanoric people, and highlights a previous item description of the silver blue armour, the armour worn by the archer Albanorics. In this older item description, the Albanorix had a much different name, as it refers to them as the Children of Silver. And this is of course tying us back to what we looked at at the beginning of the video, where there's plenty of evidence that the Albanorix are born from a silver liquid alchemical formula, with the blue silver armour even now directly saying they are born from the same source as the silver in their armour. In conclusion, the Albanorix are most likely a Nox homunculi, an alchemical experiment to create the perfect being, to create the sovereign eternal. And much like the Silver Tears, they are born of a liquid formula, hence their silver blood. One of the theories of alchemy is the notion of the Three Primes, a theory developed by an alchemist called Paracelsus in the 16th century. The three primes are salt, sulfur, and notably, for our video, mercury. But there's also a spiritual element to each of these materials, as there always is with alchemy. Salt represented the body in anything solid, mercury represented the mind in anything fluid, and sulfur represented the soul, anything that combusted. So in our case, it is clear that we would assign the silver working material behind the albanorics as a fluid mercury material, 
a bridge between body and soul, and yet neither. And it now makes sense when you think about this alchemical background, why the associations with silver, a liquid silver, or mercury, are used so heavily in the game when we look at the Nox's alchemical creations. Under this idea, this theory, every being had an aspect of all three, the mind, body, and soul, salt, mercury, and sulfur. However, these mercurial beings, these silver tears and the albinoryx, do they have a soul? Are they missing one of the three primes? This would lend us a greater understanding in why the albinoryx are seen as impure. With that said, there is one other aspect of the albinoryx alchemical formula that we must touch on, the primordial dew mentioned in the albinoryx shield item description. Now, realistically, this could be just a flowery way of describing the formula from which the albinoryx were formed, but it doesn't do us any favours to willfully ignore the other references to dew we find throughout the game. I am of course referring to the dew that is heavily associated with the Age of Plenty, mentioned in the Sacred Dew Talisman and the Icon Shield. This dew was literally the life energy that dripped from the boughs of the Erd Tree as sap and it was literal life energy. And given the word dew is used in regards to the creation of the Albanorix, there's a good chance that this primordial dew was used in their formation, especially since the word primordial is used. The word primordial is also used when describing the dew that fell from the Erd Tree in this Age of Plenty, specifically in regards to the amber medallions, which are formed of the hardened amber, the hardened dew, that fell from the Erd Tree in the Age of Godfrey, First Elden Lord. And this is not to mention the many references to primordial life when talking about the Crucible, the primordial form of the Erd Tree itself. So to me it is almost certain that this primordial dew that is mentioned in the Albanorx Shield was probably a droplet of sap taken from the Erd Tree used to bring life to these mercurial beings. And we will return to this subject at the end of the video when we talk about Latena, Loretta and the Towering Sister and how this may thematically come full circle by the end of the Albanorix story. So why were the Albanorix created in the first place? Well given all we have said on the Silver Tears and their probable connection to the Albanorix, the likely explanation is the Albanorix were created for the same reason, an attempt to create an artificial Lord of Night. So far we have made particular focus on Noxian alchemy, and this is justified given the Nox products such as the Celestial Dew, Puppet Formula, and the Silver Tears. Alchemy is particularly important to understanding what the Albanorx symbolise and why they would be created in the first place. It is no great revelation at this stage to say that the ideas of alchemy thematically influence some of the parts of Elden Ring. Of course, the most prominent example would be the idea of the Rebus, the perfect meld of male and female in a single body, as represented by the Marika Radigan Rebus. There is a concept in alchemy called the homunculus, which was the alchemical pursuit of creating the perfectly formed miniature human being. As pointed out by Zilli, there is actually a Magic the Gathering card called Homunculus that very much looks like a second generation Albanoric. This is relevant because in one of Xylestorm's discovery videos, he makes the observation that Magic the Gathering is very much an inspiration for various Elden Ring motifs, and so this connection seems all the more probable if this Homunculus card was used as the artistic inspiration for the second generation Albanorix. The alchemical process of creating a perfectly formed human being seems like the perfect solution for a society who wants to find their Lord of Night by any means necessary. And so it was that the Nox tried to create their own perfect being, their Lord of Night, and instead they created a flawed yet sentient creation, the Albanorix. At least that is my most logical speculation. The very nature of the Albanorix is an interesting thing to consider as well, as it brings us back to the Holy Grail of Lore items, the Albanoric Blood Clot. The item description of the Blood Clot makes it clear that the main reason that the Albanorix are treated like dirt is because they are not natural, and specifically, 
they are not touched by the grace of the Erd Tree. The very existence of the Albanorix is antithetical to the Erd Tree, a fitting creation for a civilization directly opposed to the Greater Will. Everything about the Albanorix origins thematically fits with them being a Nox creation and an attempt at creating a Lord of Night to oppose the Order of Grace. Now, while I consider the Nox to be the most logical progenitors of the Albanorix society, I do of course acknowledge that there is another connection that we have to consider in regards to their development, and so it is time to address the various Rhea Lucarian connections. I want to preface this chapter by saying that personally, I am in no doubt that the Nox are a better fit for the creators of the Albanorix, thematically and of what we know of the Nox. However, there are some undeniable and interesting connections to the Liarnian people that we do need to discuss, for three main reasons. The connections between the Carrions and the Albanorix, the prominence of Albanorix in Liarnia, and finally, an old item description for the Silver Armour. Let us start with the latter, the Silver Armour. So thanks to Zuli's video on the Albanorix, we have access to the previous version of the Silver Armour's item description that I'd mentioned before, but let's read that in full now. These maids, constructed in Rhea Lucaria, headed to the Paling Tower to enter Mikola's service. So obviously a lot has changed in the lore. There is no Paling Tower, and these life forms are no longer known as the Children of Silver. They are the Albanorix. So we could just straight away discount this item description and move on. However, I do think cut content can sometimes still be useful in trying to understand the intentions behind the lore, even if the details have changed. Especially since there are still connections to Raya Lucaria, Liarnia and the Carrions in regards to the Albanorix. Much as I use the location of the Silver Tears within the Eternal Cities to justify their origins being attributed to the Nox, many would use the location of the vast majority of Albanorc population in Liurnia to link their creation to the Rhea Lucarians or the Carrions, and this is totally fair, especially given we don't find any Albanorcs in the Eternal Cities. Indeed, the description of the Albanorc shield even outright states that the main enemies of the Albanorcs are sorcerers, perhaps because they were created in Liurnia and have essentially been a blight on the lands ever since, and in conflict with their previous creators, i.e. the Rhea Lucarian or Carrion sorcerers. There is further evidence that the Albanorix could have been created by sorcerers rather than by Nox alchemy, and as such I refer us to an item description I cited earlier, the description of the Albanorix staff which talks about their innate arcaneness, and while I link this to the fate manipulation and alchemy of the Nox, it could quite easily be tied to the arcane practices of Rhea Lucaria. In a lot of ways, the Rhea Lucarians and Carrions overlap with the practices and beliefs of the Nox. Both study the power latent within the stars, both are concerned with the fate found within the stars, and both have factions that are interested in bringing about an age of stars. We even get evidence of the impact of Noxian culture upon Liurnian culture, this is irrefutable in regards to the Church of Vows, which is a church lined with Noxian statues, and this is also a structure meant to utilise a Noxian creation, the Celestial Dew, once again used to alter fate and restore bonds once thought completely broken, and indeed, Radigan once used this Noxian practice before his marriage to Renala. Radigan once cleansed himself with Celestial Dew repented his territorial aggressions, and swore his love to Renala. The order of the Erdry and the fate of the moon were conjoined, and all the wounds of war forgiven. This miracle blesses the church to this day, and so you need only follow Radigan's example to restore any bond, however strained or severed, to its rightful state of harmony. In addition, Celevis, preceptor to the Carrion royal family, continues research into puppetry, and even seeks to take the teachings further by ensnaring a demigod themselves. Renala's son Radan would go to Celia to learn gravity sorcery, 
Celia essentially being an offshoot colony of the Eternal Cities. As thanks, I vow to impart to you my knowledge of the lost sorceries of the Celians, descendants of the Eternal. Finally, Rani, of course, has some contact with the Eternal City when she conspires with them to commit the Night of the Black Knives. The point being is that there are plenty of opportunities for a crossover of culture and ideas between Nox and Liurnia, and so it is therefore not unthinkable to believe that a faction of Liurnian sorcerers replicated or built upon the works of the Nox in regards to artificial life forms. Indeed, we do see a number of first generation Albanorics specifically serving the Carrion family, such as Pedia and other members found throughout the Carrion Manor. We also have Loretta herself, possibly an Albanoric, who serves as a Carrion Knight, who may well be the most successful attempt at harnessing the potential of the Albanorics, a mounted bow wielding knight, no less, that could just be a more successful variant of the mounted bow wielding Albanorics we see in the consecrated snowfields. So what is the truth behind their creation? Did the Nox create them, or was it a rare Lucarian or Carrion creation? Well, the balance of truth is for you to decide, but I believe both could be true. I do believe that they do originate from the work of the Nox. The evidence we looked at previously is too strong, and the thematics fit very well. However, it could have been expanded upon by rare Lucarians and Carrions. My belief is that the work did originate with the Nox as an experiment to create a Lord of Night, but that the rare Lucarians and Carrions may well have piggybacked off it in an attempt to create warriors and servants, and this would explain why there are so many Albanorics in Liurnia, specifically some serving the Carrion royal family. Like I say, the balance of truth, or where you decide they come from, is for you to decide. I believe it falls between the two. Either way, the results are the same. Human hands created these flawed beings, and whatever purpose they hope to harness these beings for, it has clearly failed and the Albanorks now are in direct conflict with the forces of Rhea Lucaria and are persecuted by many others. So let us now examine the current state of the Albanorks themselves and their plight in the lands between. However it happened, the Albanorks were created, but they are no mere tools as probably intended. Instead, they have developed into their very own people, with their own desires and beliefs. There's of course the main distinguishing feature of the Albanoric peoples, the two very distinct generation. The first more humanoid variation which comes in two different variants, the older male version and the younger female version. Then there is the second generation which are the more frog-like and dumpy ones. We learned that there are two different generations of the same people via the Albanoric ashes which reads, a strapping duo of cartwheeling spirits who wield ripple swords and spew freezing breath. Both are second generation Albanorics with dumpy heads that resemble those of frogs. So the fact that there are a second generation could mean one of two things. Firstly, it could be that the first generation of Albanorics are able to reproduce, but their offspring are radically different from them or devolve. And then there's of course explanation number two, which is much like how iPhones have different generations. The second generation of Albanorics could be a second line of Albanorics, that they are a second attempt by their creators to improve upon the first generation. Given what we know about the Albanorics at the end of Latina's quest, it appears they cannot reproduce, and so it must be option two. We know that one of the main faults of the first generation is of course their failing and fading legs. This is a process described to us by Old Albus himself. My legs will soon fade, and with them my life. Alas, this is the immovable fate of all Albinorics. So why do their legs fade and fail? Well, given the alchemical and magical origin of the Albinorics, it would make sense that this is an alchemical failing. The legs don't only fail, they literally fade, as we can see from the shadowy remnants we can see attached to the older Albanorics. 
So it makes sense now that there is a second generation of Albanorix. The first generation are quote unquote faulty, and the second generation do improve in this regard. They are able to walk, but they have their own feelings uh, we will look at momentarily. There are other aspects of the first generation I'd like to analyse first. One point of interest is of course the first generation's unbelievable skill with magical bows. Latena's ashes do confirm that they are magical archers, which explains why their arrows literally track moving opponents. Their ability to do this must be a result of their innate magical arcaneness, and I do see this as evidence that Loretta is one of their number, as she too is able to summon magical homing arrows, but without a bow, possibly showing she is more potent in this regard, more successful, not even needing the physical medium for this ability. There's one other aspect of the first generation I want to talk about, and that is their appearance. I have already spoken on the fact that there are two variants to the first generation, as most people will notice. There is the older variant, which has male features, and then there is the younger variant, which has female features. Now, the simplest explanation, and probably the most likely, is that this is just the design choice made by the team, that they had younger models and they're female, and they had older models that are male. However, there is something else to consider, given the alchemical roots and connotations to the Albanorix. And the question I pose to you is this, are the first generation Albanorix some kind of rebus? What I am suggesting here is, is it possible that they are female when they are young, but become male when they age, and that they are some sort of alchemical hermaphrodite? Now, I know this is a bit out there, but I can't help but notice that the female Albanorx are always mentioned to be young. Latena refers to Philia, the giant towering Albanorx, as their young but towering sister. Albus also refers to Latena as young, and yet all the male appearance characters in the Albanorx society are older, bearded, and decrepit, and their legs are literally fading. While the legs of the younger Albanorx are of course also not working, they aren't fading yet, which suggests there is an age gap. Now, the reason that this is important to something connected to alchemy is because of the concept of the rebus. If you aren't aware of the rebus or you haven't heard my earlier videos where I've spoken about it, the rebus is said to be the ultimate goal of alchemy. It is the perfect meld between man and female in a single body. And of course, this is represented in game by Marika and Radigan. So being beings of alchemical creation, what if they are created to follow the same ideals, to be the perfect creation of alchemy, to mirror the god of this age? This is of course wild speculation, and it's not something I certainly consider to be canon, but it is a nice idea, especially since it would tie in with the alchemical themes of the Albanorix, as well as nicely explaining why there are only young female Albanorix and older male Albanorix. If that is too wild for you, I do have another possible explanation for you, and it does again return us to that older description of the silver armour, which specifically describes the maidens as being built in Rhea Lucaria. Perhaps the first generation female Albanorx are the creations of Rhea Lucaria, and the older male ones are the creations of the Nox, and this would also make sense and tie in to the fact that Loretta serves the Carrion royal family and is most likely following the design of the female archer Albanorix. Again, all speculation and the most likely explanation is that it's just the design choices for the male and female models of the Albanorix first generations. However, the other final point about the Albanorix and their form I want to discuss before moving on to the second generation specifically is the general connection the Albanorix have to Frost. So one of the major indicators to this connection is of course found in the Albanorc Ashes, which tells us the fact they can spew freezing breath. We also find it connected to the Archer Albanorix, for the blue silver armour tells us that it is made from the same material as the Archers itself, and it provides a protection to Frost. So what is the connection to Frost? Well, in general, there seems to be a connection to Frost, and the celestial bodies. The main source for this information, of course, comes via Rani, and her story about meeting the Snow Witch. For example, if we read the item description of the Frozen Armament, which reads as follows. 
sorcery said to have been used by the old Snow Witch. The Snowy Crone taught the young Rani to fear the Dark Moon as she imparted her cold sorcery. And so when Rani attempts to bring about the Age of Stars, the Dark Moon becomes her sigil and her guide. However, equally, the cold seems to be part of her makeup, part of her identity. This is reinforced by the description of the Royal Greatsword, which reads, In defiance of the fate he was born into, Blythe swore to serve no master but Rani. As proof, the sword was imbued with cold magic at the moment the oath was sworn. And so the cold is as equal to the moon when it comes to Rani and her ideals. And to me, this is just because the cold or frost is associated with the moon and other celestial bodies in this world. And this is in contrast to the Erd Tree, which once used to represent warmth, as we learn from the Warming Stone item description. And so to me, the association with cold that we find with the Albanorix has to do with their origins once again. We know that the Nox are of course associated with the Celestial, and most likely use the distillation or essence of the stars to create the Albanorix in the first place, and that in essence explains their affinity for the cold. But with that said, let us now move on to the second generation and examine these peculiar creatures. While without the weaknesses of the first generation, regarding their legs, they have obviously come with their own flaws. Aside from being more monstrous and malformed than their more human first generation, they also apparently cannot speak. This is again according to the cut tops dialogue that we referred to earlier, that states that the frogs have been silenced in regards to their tongues. I have no doubt to believe that this is still true in the in-game canon, despite it not being mentioned explicitly anywhere else in canon. I think this is also reflected in the way they behave, especially if you compare them to the first generation. There is a huge difference in the culture. Whereas the first generation seem more human and are willing to set up their own societies, much like a human society would, the second generation seem to move around in roving gangs or bands, much like an animal pack. And if these beings lack the ability to intelligently communicate, like the first generation can, this indeed does make sense. Even the armour and clothing that they wear pales in comparison if you compare it to the silver armour of the Archer Albanorix. The second generation Albanorix wear dirty sacks and dirty chainmail. But this doesn't mean that there isn't any connection or interaction between the two generations. Indeed, in the consecrated snowfields, it seems as though they exist peacefully side by side, with the Albanoric archers and the second generation Albanorix guarding Ordina liturgical town. Indeed, I commented on the apparel of the second generation Albanorix, how it's dirty and crude, and it reflects the more bestial and basic nature of the second generation. And while this meshes well with the huge clubs of some of the larger second generation Albanorix, it clashes quite harshly with some of the other weapons wielded by the second generation. The silver shield, the ripple blade, and the ripple crescent halberd, which seems so finely crafted, to a degree beyond even some human capabilities. Indeed, not only the form of these weapons are sophisticated, but also the lore bended within its design. As you can see from all of the descriptions for these weapons, they are meant to be artistic representations of the Albanorix origins, the ripple of their alchemical formula. Given what we see of the second generation Albanorix, the way in which they behave, the clothes that they wear and the clubs that they wield, it seems very unlikely that they are the ones that crafted these weapons. I would instead suggest that these weapons are supplied to them by the first generation Albanorix, who would be more familiar with their mythology and origins, and more likely to be able to forge impressive weapons, given what we see of their craftsmanship in their silver armour. This is my own speculation of course, but I believe it to be a sensible conclusion. To surmise, the first generation appear to be closer, what we'd consider to be a normal human society. We can see this in the way in which they act, speak, interact, and build communities. The second generation Albanorix, while still sentient, do seem to be more simplistic in nature, moving in roaming gangs, more aggressive and territorial, and more likely to be manipulated, as we will see in later chapters. 
Despite this, the second generation clearly have caused a lot of issues for the rare Lucarians and the Cuckoo Warriors. Their location around the crumbled ruins of the Academy Town is interesting for a number of reasons, not the least that the rare Lucarians and the Cuckoo Knights seem to have had to barricade themselves in at the rare Lucarian Academy, essentially ceding the ground outside of it to these Albanorix. Were the Albanorix responsible for the downfall for the destruction of the Academy Town? Probably not as it does seem that some kind of natural disaster has befallen this region, an erosion that has led to a collapse of the land that once surrounded the Rhea Lucarian Academy. We can see this in the bridges as well. Despite this, the Albanorics now seem to have taken control of these ruins, and this is a fair payment, as we will learn in the next chapter, when we talk about the persecution that the Albanoric people have faced in the lands between. One of the best written sources to understand the type of hatred the Albanorcs face is the Albanorc Pot, a weapon that can be made from the blood of the Albanorcs themselves. The item description reads as follows. The Knights of the Cuckoos do declare, Behold, thy defiled blood, unlike any humour that flows in our grand realm. This basis for Cuckoo Force's hatred of the Albanorcs of course ties in with what was said in the Albanoric blood clot, that people hate the Albanorics because they are not natural beings, and in essence, this seems to be the basis for a lot of their mistreatment as they aren't even seen as living beings worthy of consideration. While quite late on in the video, it is worth analysing the etymology of the name Albanoric to see how it is an appropriate name. Alban most directly means white, but can also mean without colour or pigment, and auric means gold. So the most likely meaning for the Albanorix, as intended, is without gold, without the gold colour. These are pale beings, absent the gold, absent the touch of the earth tree. Again, tying back to what's said in the Albanoric blood clot. It is this lack of gold, the lack of a connection to the earth tree, that makes them so hated. And again it ties back to what we talked about when we talked about the prime materials. They are missing that third aspect, the soul or the touch of the Erd Tree. The Knights of the Cuckoo are of course the Knights that are contracted on behalf of Rhea Lucaria, and these forces have a pretty sinister reputation. We learn of this reputation via the Rhea Lucaria Soldier Ashes, which reads, The soldiers of Rhea Lucaria were also known as the Cuckoos. They were given free reign by the Academy to wage war as they pleased, and they were infamous for their rapacious ways. The cruelty of these soldiers lend well to the narrative described by the Albanorc Pot. They hunt the Albanorcs because of their defiled blood, and yet given their reputation, it wouldn't be hard to imagine Cuckoo forces not needing much encouragement to visit atrocities upon these people and taking some kind of pleasure in it. It also ties into the description of the Albanorc Shield, which describes the fact that sorcerers were their main enemies and it is obviously the conflict with Rhea Lucaria that this shield is denoting. The clashes with Rhea Lucaria are most likely driven by hate and territory, as we have already commented on the fact that the Albanorix occupy a lot of Rhea Lucarian territory. Yet aside from the conflicts between the second generation and the forces of Rhea Lucaria, the first generation found in Liurnia seem to have made a life for themselves in the village of the Albanorix, they do seem to have built a community and even have their own myths and goals as we can later see when Albus describes to us their promised land. Yet unfortunately this life has been destroyed and the village that we see now is the site of an atrocity. The most obvious and stark example of how poorly the Albanorics are treated in the lands between. When we first arrive in the village we are greeted by the corpses of Albanorics hanging and piles of corpses being burned in a harrowing scene of genocide and cruelty. Nefeli's haunting words as we enter the village only add to the grisly atmosphere that awaits us within. The oppression of the weak. Murder and pillage unchecked. A waking nightmare made by men. The goons that we find in this village, fallen perfumers, are Gideon Ofnir's men, who in his pursuit for knowledge has destroyed this entire village. And his callous disregard for the lives here even shocks Nefeli when she realises it's her adoptive father that's behind this attack. And I... 
can no longer trust in father. To think he'd order his men to enact such tragedy. Where is the justice he purports in that? He once told me that if he became Elden Lord, he would never allow the downtrodden to be cheated ever again. Was he simply lying to me? Of course we later find out that Gideon has done this for a pretty petty reason. He is obsessed with knowledge, with his own legend of being the all-knowing. In essence, he wants to have information he doesn't have. The location of the missing demigods. Not really just to find their great runes, but just so he can carry on being the all-knowing. And indeed later on, he directs us to find information on the missing demigods, and even notes his frustration in not knowing all of the information. I heard speculation Mikola embedded himself in the Haley tree, but before he could finish, someone cut the tree open and absconded with his infant form. Indeed, it seems those words held weight. How vexing that the all-knowing didn't have the full story. Yet before employing our services, he obviously used his own men, his own goons, to try and find the information from the Alban Orcs himself in regards to the Halic Tree and obviously Mikola and Melania. He has Latena interrogated and her wolf killed, and he burns the entire village to the ground just so he can find the path to the Halic Tree and have the answers to the questions that he seeks. A pretty casual disregard for life, and it just shows how lowly some people consider Alban Oryx, that Gideon weighs their lives worth less than just knowing a simple piece of information. How little regard is given to the lives of these people is also echoed in Praetor Rykard's treatment of the Alban Oryx. I discuss Praetor Rykard's experimentation in full in my Rykard lore video, which I will link below, but in essence the prison town at Volcano Manor is a testament to Rykard's insanity and his cruelty. Rykard uses the abductor virgins to bring people to the prison town found at the back of Volcano Manor, where he has evidently experimented with life forms as part of his greater aim in overthrowing the Erd Tree to create the Man Serpents, soldiers for his vision. In Prison Town, we find a large population of Alban Oryx in terrible circumstances, as they fill the halls of the ironically named Guest House in various torture devices, including the really cruel Black Dumpling which makes the wearer go insane. And the wretched, tortured, black dumpling wearing Alban Oryx are some of the most wretched and pitiful enemies you face in the entire game. These poor Alban Oryx have been pushed to the limits of pain and mental torture. Also interestingly, this is where we find the Alban Oryx mask, located on another torture device. The description of the mask is interesting, as it makes a very clear implication that this is the mask made from the skin of an Albanoric. The final description of the Albanoric mask reads as follows. A far cry from God's skin, this Albanoric hide mask is the product of malicious mockery. The implication being is that this Albanoric was skinned by a God skin, and this makes sense given that there is a God skin present at Prison Town, the God skin noble found in Eagle Temple. Now, while to some this Godskin Noble boss may feel random, I have discussed in my Rykard video why it makes sense. Firstly, they are both allies of convenience. They both wish to overthrow the gods. But secondly, they also both get something out of the arrangement. As already shown by the skin Dolben Auric, the Godskin Noble gets access to plenty subjects for skinning and for skin. Much as the Godskin Apostle of Dominula manipulates their festivities to get access to fresh skin. Rykard gains the Godskin Nobles knowledge of blending life, bearing in mind the Godskin Noble set reads the following. Nobles are the most ancient apostles who are said to have assimilated inhuman physiology. Indeed, it is important to note that the Godskin Nobles have assimilated serpentine features, namely a tail, to mostly human physiology. So now we understand why the Godskin Noble is here, but why are the Alban Oryx here? Why are they tortured? Well, because they too are artificial beings, and for someone like Rykard looking to craft weapons to overthrow the Erd Tree and eventually create his own life forms, the Man Serpents, why not start with the creations of the Nox, a society who has long been seeking to overthrow the Erd Tree and create life forms to that end? As beings made from an alchemical formula, Reverse engineering the Alban Oryx could be key for Rykard to understand how he can make his own life forms. 
This is of course my speculation, but I believe it is the story that Prison Town is trying to tell us. What is important is the further illustration of the senseless harm that is inflicted upon the Alban Oryx, seemingly without care nor thought. Human upon human conflicts are memorialised in sword monuments at the very least, but Alban Oryx seem to be beneath notice at all, treated as though they aren't really living, thinking, sentient beings, just another material or animal to be harvested or an annoyance to be exterminated. The dehumanisation of the Alban Oryx is one of the most brutal stories of the land between, and the core of it is once again found in the Alban Oryx blood clot. It is because they are seen out with the Earth Tree Order. They aren't even seen as real life. The examples we have gone through here are only scratching the surface of the barbarism that the Alban Oryx face, and it always seems done in such a casual, senseless fashion. For example, we also find strung up Alban Oryx in the hideout of Necromancer Garrus, and we can only assume that he too has used them as a subject for his experimentation into necromancy. Cast out and brutalised, it is little wonder that the Alban Oryx are outsiders, who must eke out a living in a cruel and unforgiving world. They are outcasts, and in the next chapter, we will find out where this brutalisation has pushed them to, and where they try to find sanctuary. While Lyernia is the main hub of Alban Oryx activity in the lands between, we do find them in a couple of different locations. One of the more interesting locations is of course in Mogwin Palace, where they appear to be in service to the Lord of Blood, and I find the story of these wayward Alban Oryx particularly interesting, because it can tell us a lot of the Alban Oryx people, both in a physical sense and of their desperation. The Mogwin dynasty presents itself as one of love and acceptance, a safe haven for those who have no place in the world of grace. Luminary Moog has strength, vision, and of course, love. This is of course given legitimacy by the fact that Moog himself is an omen, a people unwelcome in the world of grace. He is the king of the outcasts in a sense. It is no wonder that a persecuted people may feel drawn to such a community, and indeed the placement of the enemies within Lyurnia and the consecrated Snowfield hint at this draw that the Mogwin dynasty has to the Alban Oryx. The centre of the Formless Mother's influence in Lyurnia is of course Rose Church, and if you want more detailed look at all things Mogwin dynasty, I would direct you to my Moog Lord of Blood video. Near Rose Church, you can find a group of Alban Oryx staring at the Rose Church, almost curiously, as if they are being drawn to this church and are considering joining the Mogwin dynasty. We also see this in the consecrated snowfield when you find an Alban Oryx standing very close to the bloody portal that leads to the Moog palace. When we form our own covenant with the Formless Mother and Mogwin dynasty, we give our finger over to Vare, who then seems to inject us with something, and we then receive the bloody finger item in return. Oh, good heavens. Clench your teeth or something. The description for this bloody finger item reads as follows. Glistening blood has been siphoned into the nail of this finger. Its sickly pale skin feels nothing now, but the nail still aches with sweetest pain. This isn't an item, this is our finger. We have been afflicted by the blood that Vary siphoned into our fingernail, and we can see the effect of this transfusion in our eyes, which go a cloudy red after this process. This is a covenant in its purest form, an exchange of blood that forms a binding pact between ourselves and Moog. Indeed, as I suggested months ago in my Moog lore video, I believe that the blood being siphoned into us is the accursed omen blood of the Lord of Blood himself. Indeed, Vary says this following the ceremony. Never forget that feeling of agony, for it is what binds you to Luminary Moog, to all of us. It binds us to Moog because it is his blood. It binds us to the dynasty as we all now share the blood the omen blood that runs through our veins, and I believe we can see the effect of the omen blood on the dynasty nobles, who have omen horns and pale skin like Moog, 
like the Omen. With this in mind, let us turn our attention back to the Alban Oryx, as it seems some of them have taken up the offer of love and acceptance by the Mogwin dynasty. A lot of Alban Oryx end up in the consecrated snowfields, promised lands that we will discuss in a moment, and while most seem to seek the Aegis of Mikla, others seem to find another path here, a certain blood-covered portal that lead to the lands of Moog. At the area where the portal spits us out, on the cliff overlooking the blood-blighted lands of Moog, we get a really interesting scene. We see a group of blood Alban Oryx patrolling a group of regular Alban Oryx, and to me this scene couldn't be clearer. These are new inductees that are being guarded before they too are accepted and inducted. When filming these shots up close, it genuinely broke my heart a little. The exhausted look of the regular Alban Oryx, of a people who have been persecuted and hunted their whole lives, finally feeling they have some kind of sanctuary. And while Moog does preach love, it is clear he cares as little for the Alban Oryx as the rest of the lands between. For if one looks carefully at the environmental details in Mogwin Palace, we are confronted by a horrific scene. Alban Oryx corpses, strewn carelessly, left to rot and soak in the bloody bogs, with no care for dignity or burial. So the storytelling here is pretty clear. Not all Alban Oryx who make it here will survive whatever induction process they must undertake, and the callous treatment of their dead speaks volumes about Moog's real feelings towards his Alban Oryx soldiers. Moog only cares for them as shock troopers, and I think this really highlights the sad reality of the second generation Alban Oryx. They are simple, trusting beings, and while we cannot blame them for seeking refuge here, it is clear that Moog abuses that trust. But tragedy aside, let us look at the blood Alban Oryx and what it can tell us about the Alban Oryx in general. Looking at this original scene again, the two groups are contrasted quite clearly. Not only do the blood Alban Oryx have bright red skin, but as I note in my Moog video, like the sanguine nobles, these blood Alban Oryx also have omen horns poking through their skin at the top of their heads. This again suggests that those Alban Oryx that become bound to the dynasty go through the same joining process that we do. They have Moog's omen blood injected. The radical nature of their transformation is really interesting, however, as we can see the effects on humans are a little bit more subtle and more like a corruption or infection, whereas it seems more akin to a palate change entirely for the Alban Oryx. This does make sense, however, when we consider the alchemical origins of the Alban Oryx that we discussed previously. I see it as the Alban Oryx being malleable, that they are still formulaic in a way, and by adding a new element to the formula, it drastically alters the Alban Oryx as it would a potion. We have also to consider the words of the Alban Oryx staff. Alban Oryx are innately arcane, and as such their bodies may be affected differently by the Omen curse than a more mundane creature like a human. This is not the only instance of this formula change. In certain parts of the consecrated snowfield, we can find the golden-eyed Alban Oryx, who can wield the golden disc incantations of Mikola the Unalloyed. Of course, we don't know for certain what material could have affected them in this way, these golden-eyed ones, but a good educated guess could be that it's unalloyed gold, given that they are in the lands of Mikola and the promised lands of their people. With that said, it is to these promised lands that we turn to next, to discuss the future of the Alban Oryx peoples and their heroes, Latena and Loretta. In the face of so much persecution within the lands between, it is very little wonder that the Alban Oryx have come up with a classic Promised Lands story, one that we can hear from the mouth of old Albus himself. A chosen land awaits us, Alban Oryx. The medallion is the key that leads to the city. It's only a quaint treasure for we who cannot make the journey, but for dear Latena, it is needed to fulfill her purpose. Yet this isn't a mere myth, as it seems as though the village has already placed their hopes with Latena, a young female Alban Oryx who Albus pleads with us to give the medallion to and take to the Promised Lands. This is the young woman that Ofnir has already beaten and interrogated in his quest to find Mikola. Upon meeting Latena, 
Once we show her that we have the medallion and earned Albus's trust, she opens up and asks for our help in reaching Mikola's Halig Tree, the promised land that old Albus mentions to us. This of course brings us to Loretta, one of the fabled knights of the Carrion Dynasty, and apparently the only person moved by the plight of the Alban Oryx. Not only was Loretta one of the legendary Carrion Knights, but she was a personal guard to the Carrion royalty, and we learn of this via her armour set, which reads as follows. Loretta, once a royal Carrion Knight, went on a journey in search of a haven for the Alban Oryx, and determined that the Halig Tree was their best chance for eventual salvation. The rest is, as they say, history. Loretta replaces her glintstone for unalloyed gold in her sickle, and becomes a defender of the Halig Tree rather than carry a manor. Word reaches the Alban Oryx of Loretta's discovery of this promised land, and many Alban Oryx make the pilgrimage here, such as the golden Alban Oryx we previously discussed, found in and around Ordina. We then also have the Alban Oryx of the first generation, the Wolf Archers, who protect passage to the Halig Tree itself by defending Ordina liturgical town. For all intents and purposes, this is a sort of happy ending. Loretta has found somewhere for the Alban Oryx to hide out safely, to build a new future, under the aegis of Mikola in his lands, an Empyrean well known to extend his protection to the outcasts of Erdtree society, such as we see many misbegotten in the Halig Tree town itself, and as we learn through the description of the Sacred Crown Helm, which reads as follows. Who is it that Mikola shall bless, if not the low and the meek? Indeed, we have to assume that, like Loretta, the Alban Oryx found in the consecrated snowfield owe some loyalty to Mikola, guarding passage to the Halig Tree in exchange for being allowed to settle here, as well as being evidenced by the golden Alban Oryx that we spoke of earlier, Alban Oryx that seem to have taken on the miracles and appearance of the unalloyed himself. And in fact, the Alban Oryx people are the main obstacle preventing us from accessing the Halig Tree itself. But did Loretta find this safe haven because she is a human who has greater empathy than her fellow Lyurnians? Or does she have a deeper, more personal reason for helping the Alban Oryx? This is of course hinted at via her shield description which reads, The shape is said to imitate that of a sacred drop of dew, which inspired the absurd rumour that Loretta herself was an Alban Oryx. The implication here is that the sacred drop of dew that's imitated by her shield is the one that's also displayed on the general Albanoric shield, the source of all Albanoric life. But is this an absurd rumour, or is it actually real? We never see beneath Loretta's visor, and she is always mounted, and therefore could be in a similar situation to the first generation Albanoric, in that she has lost use of her legs and always has to be mounted. We also have to consider that Loretta's magic is extremely reminiscent of the magic wielded by the Albanoric archers. She summons a bow that fires homing arrows, much like the Albanoric archers can use magical homing arrows as well. This could be a more potent form of that particular archery magic. At the end of the day, we don't know for certain, and this bit of lore is worded in a way as to cause us some confusion, but if I was to give my opinion, I would say she is meant to be an Albanoric given the way she uses magic, and the fact that she is always mounted, never mind the fact that she went to such lengths to find a home for the Alban Oryx. But again, I leave you to your own conclusions. Either way, it was Loretta who finally paved the way for a better chance at life for the Alban Oryx. But perhaps there is more for them here than just a safe haven. Perhaps there is a future for the Albanoric people. Albus impressed upon us the importance of Latena making it to the Promised Lands. And if we do so, if we help Latena reach the Promised Lands of the Consecrated Snowfields, we can witness one of the happiest moments in any Souls game. A future for the Albanoric people that they so sorely deserve. Oh young yet towering sister of ours. Let the birthing drop let in, and create life, for us, for all the Albanorics. 
When we first enter the consecrated snowfields, there is a dialogue where Latena states the following. We have reached the lands of Mikola's Halig Tree, where Lobo and I began our travels. It is entirely thanks to you that I am so close to home. These great snow-laden lands stretch far to the north, and beyond the ancient bowers and the liturgical town of Ordina lies the place to which I must return. Latena has been here before. This is where she began her journey and where she is to return. And given that she is of the archer archetype, and this is the only place we find them, it makes sense that this is her home. This means that Latena travelled from here to Liurnia to collect something, and then return it to the Towering Sister. This makes sense of why Gideon specifically targets Latena. He knows that she has come from the Halig Tree area, and thus must have a way back, or at least have knowledge, of how to get back there. But what has Latena come for? She evidently came for the item that she passes on to the Towering Sister, what she calls the Birthing Droplet, an item or a substance that will allow the Towering Sister to provide new life for the Albanoric people. The broad strokes of what is happening here is quite straightforward to everyone. This Birthing Droplet will allow the Albanorics to give birth to reproduce or create their own new life as an independent race. It is a quiet moment, but to me is as powerful as the A Future for the Krogan scene in Mass Effect 3. We have just witnessed the future of a people being granted. But what is the nitty gritty of what's happening here? What's the science? Why is the giant sister giant? What is the birthing droplet and where did it come from? First of all, why the giant sister is important and why she is giant. Well, first of all, we do have a name for this character. As if you are horrendous enough to kill Latena, she cries out a name. Philia. With one less L, Philia is the Greek word for love. Philia is the love of her people. She is the hope of her people, and evidently the vessel through which they hope to bring about a new generation of Albanorix. But why is she large and why is she special? So we don't really know this for sure, but to try and provide some kind of satisfactory answer, I would again refer us to the origins of the Albanorix, and specifically looking at the blue silver armour, this time paying special attention to the semantics. It says, Blue silver is a metal born from the same mother as the archers themselves, and provides protection from magic and frost. When talking about the origins of the Albanorix, I skipped over the mother aspect of it to focus on the alchemy, but it is curious to note that the term mother is actually used here. Does this imply that there was a mother Albanoric, an original creation, a progenitor to their race that was used to spawn or clone the rest? Perhaps a mother Albanoric figure like Philia was used as a template or queen that gave birth to the blue silver, as described by the silver blue armour set. Now, I don't necessarily claim that this is Philia herself, especially given that Latena calls her young, implying that she is newly born or created, but perhaps she is a recreation of this mother. Perhaps she has been created by the Albanorics themselves as a host for a new generation of Albanorics, recreating that original experiment. This is of course my own speculation, but she is obviously very different, she is meant to be a special host for a new generation, and it does really make me think of this mother mentioned in the blue silver armour set. Another theory that I've seen is that people suggest that she is Loretta, given Loretta's shield position here. However, I don't think this is true, given that we fight Loretta in her corporeal form in Halig Tree Town. Now, in regards to the birthing droplet that Latena passes to the Towering Sister, we have already spoken of how the Albanorix are alchemical in nature, and that by adding or introducing something foreign into their forms, it can radically alter their makeup, such as omen blood in the blood Albanorix, or possibly unalloyed gold in the gold eye Albanorix. This brings us around to our early discussion of the original Albanoric formula and the three primes, where I posited that the Albanorix were created from a combined formula of mercury suffused with celestial essence and a primordial dew from the Erd Tree. Here it seems the Albanorics are repeating the same process but on their own terms. They control their future. 
Again, like when I was talking about the primordial dew, I think there's only one sensible place to look when talking about this birthing droplet, and that is the Erd Tree. The Erd Tree is synonymous with life, and thus it makes sense when Latina talks about bringing new life to the Albanort people, the sap of the Erd Tree, a life bringing substance, would make sense here. And thus we come full circle with the Albanort blood clot. The Albanort people are persecuted because of their disconnect from the Erd Tree and its rigidly defined and controlled cycle of life. How fitting would it be then if it was the sap of that very Erd Tree that gives the Albanorks a new chance at life to bring about their own births and their own future? And how fitting is it that we come full circle with the item description we started this video with? the greatest lore item in the game, the Albanort Blood Clot. A people that are not touched by the Erd Tree's grace, finally are given a new chance with the Erd Tree's own sap. So thanks guys, that is my take on the Albanort people and their tragic tale in the Lands Between. It is one of the most interesting and poignant stories in all of From Software's games, in my opinion. And it was a very special video for me to make because the Albanorks have always been a really interesting an important part of the lore for me. And if you are new to the channel, you may have caught on that the Albanort blood clot has always been a bit of a running meme on this channel. As I recently hit 100k, I thought it would be important to do the Albanorks and do the Albanort blood clot some justice. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please leave a comment and a like below. If you think I missed anything, please leave your comment below and let me know where I went wrong, as well as leaving your thoughts on what I should cover next. If you'd like to support the channel in other ways, I do have channel memberships, as well as a Patreon. But until next time guys, I will see you in the consecrated snowfields. Take care, and have a wonderful night.